We are continuing our lessons on essential qualities of church leadership. And we are today looking at today's leaders need to be alert, to be vigilant. We return again to the 20th chapter of the book of Acts, where the Apostle Paul addresses the elders of Ephesus as he has met with them in Miletus. When he says to them in verse 28, be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. In verse 29, he says, I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will arise, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be on the alert remembering that night and day for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one with tears. And then he goes on to say in verse 32, now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. When we look at the need for leaders in the church, you say a church has no elders. And if a church has elders, especially looking very uh, hard at Acts 20, 28 through verse 32, elders have a grave or serious responsibility. And it's not sometimes viewed as an easy task. That's the second point for our lesson today as we look at Roman numerals 11 and 12. The need for leaders to be watchful, to be attentive and heedful even to themselves. So you think about the need of being alert and being vigilant. There will always be people who teach error. Many times these people are among uh, the church members. Sometimes they are members of the congregation uh, where you preach or where the elders are serving. And it's very critical that it be recognized that these false teachers have to be dealt with one way or another. So Paul will tell them in verse 28 to guard themselves for, first, but then for all the flock. The reason there is a plurality of elders, uh, you could say not just one reason, but many reasons, is that people need shepherding. And God has placed his church in the hands of qualified and diligent servants in the kingdom called elders, shepherds, bishops, overseers, to take care of that flock like a shepherd would take care of his sheep. And so an elder has to be attentive he should be attentive to every single member of the church. He should be attentive to everything that may arise and question, should I address this? Is it serious? If it's not serious, you might just think about it for a while. But then there are times when false teachers have to be confronted. Uh, actually, these First, these points that are on the screen today really should go together, and they do go together. When you think about the importance of elders, elders are like watchmen on the wall of spiritual Zion. In Ezekiel chapter 3, the Lord has talked and spoken with the prophet Ezekiel about a problem that was arising among God's people. And Ezekiel, I want to go to Ezekiel chapter 33, beginning with verse 7. Uh, chapter 3, verses 16 and 19 are essentially the same. But God speaks directly to the prophet Ezekiel. And he tells him, Now as for you, son of man, I have appointed you a watchman for the house of Israel. So you will hear a message from my mouth and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, O wicked man, you will surely die, 
and you do not speak to warn the wicked from his way, the wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require from your hand. We understand what God is saying here to Ezekiel that if, if someone wicked has come among God's people and is a threat to them, Ezekiel was commanded by the Lord to challenge that false teacher or those false teachers. And But the first thing he was supposed to do was warn God's people that those teachers were teaching error. They would lead them away from the Jehovah God of the Old Testament era. And Ezekiel was told very clearly if you don't warn them, I'm going to require it of you. You know, the Hebrews writer tells us in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 17 that one day the elders will give an account to God for the way they have shepherded. And so it's not merely uh, a, an easy task. He goes on to say, in verse 8, when I say to the wicked man, you shall surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require from your hand. But, verse 9, if you on your part warn a wicked man to turn from his way, and he does not turn from his way, he will die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your life. And he goes on to speak to, to Ezekiel in chapter 10 to speak to the house of Israel and warning them about transgressions, their, their sinfulness. An elder's job is not easy. God did not intend for one man to have to deal with this alone, but sometimes if you don't have elders in your congregation, you may have to do it alone as a preacher or get with another brother who is faithful to help you deal with these things or any number of brothers. Error is error, and it must be confronted. You know, in Hebrews chapter 12, I love to study Hebrews, and especially in verse 22, we have the record there of God speaking about the church being the spiritual Zion of God. So in that sense, God's people are, the, are God's Zion today. And so elders, shepherds, overseers have the responsibility to make sure that if maybe their sheep are being led astray by this or by that, regardless of the source. First of all, warn the sheep. You may not even know who the false teacher is, but maybe you've heard or noticed that some of your sheep are saying things that are not accurate or you know they're listening to things that they shouldn't. So, when you think about Roman numeral 12 here, to be courageous, it is also loving to talk with those sheep and let them know what you've been listening to is not, it's not biblical. It's not true. But be ready, dear brother, to show them from the scripture what is true and why what they've been hearing is not true. Point them to the word of God. That's exactly what God told Ezekiel in so many words. When you speak, Ezekiel, you're speaking for me, God would say, to warn those people. Now, there, there are some things that crop up from time to time that may not be all that threatening. Uh, even so, you may have to deal with it, but also, it is not the shepherd's job to be looking for every little thing all the time and spending all his time, as, as our lesson says, to look under every rock for a, for a problem. Uh, you can become very extreme in this and be so focused on that that you may not be in carrying out some of your other duties. I think you understand that there has to be a balance here. Every little thing that a brother or sister might hear may not be a, uh, a soul-threatening problem. It may not be. But if it is, naturally, you would have to look at it. So we looked at the next section here of today's leaders being courageous. And this actually goes hand in hand with what we just looked at uh, above about being alert and being vigilant. And so... When you're alert and vigilant and have to deal 
with these challenges, um, it takes courage. And but sometimes it's unpleasant. It's not fun, as we might sometimes say. It's not joyful to deal with some of these problems. But if God's people are being threatened or you've been given a charge to teach, then you must carry out that duty. God is depending on you. And I think about that from time to time. I may think, well, how does the church view me as a preacher or a teacher? Or how does the church view me as an elder or a shepherd? And that's an important thing to consider. But the first thing we need to consider is how does how does God see how I'm carrying out my duties? You know, when God sent Joshua to go and settle the land of Canaan, you have to love Joshua. Moses trained him, as we learned in an earlier section of our studies here. He had been brought along by Moses from being a young man. Moses has died now. Joshua is the leader of God's people. And you begin reading with verse 6, where God says to Joshua, as he leads God's people into the land of Canaan, be strong and courageous. For you shall give this people possession of the land, which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and notice in verse seven, very courageous. God knew that it would take a lot of courage on Joshua's part once they got active in settling the land and confronting those people who obviously would not want the children of Israel to come in there and take over their land, even though God had told them to destroy those people, Joshua was the leader. And he says, be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left so that you may have success wherever you go. This book of the law, verse 8, shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have success. Verse 9, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. That's the third time God said that. Do not tremble or be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. That's a challenging text, but at the end, it's encouraging. We know that today as Christians, we're not under the law of Moses. We're under the law of Christ. And so when Paul spoke to the elders of Ephesus in Acts chapter 20, he said, I commend you to God and the word of his grace, which obviously is New Testament teaching for the spiritual Zion, New Testament teaching for the Lord's church. That means an elder needs to study and know and understand what the Bible teaches and know what to look for and what is potentially problematic, know, to know the difference between truth and error. And as God told Joshua, don't go to the right or the left, just go straight down the middle with it. And that is, you stay with what the law of Moses says. Today's preachers and elders and any other uh, Christian, concerned Christian, in dealing with helping brethren who may be being led astray, stay with the book. Stay with the New Testament. What does it teach about this doctrine or this position that some person may be espousing? And then you have Caleb in Joshua 14 and verse 12, where Caleb spoke about his role about going into the land of Canaan. So Joshua and Caleb went together. Then you think about those many men. David, uh, David had supporters when he was having to ultimately fight against the house of Saul in order to position himself as king. We know that God chose David as king. Samuel was there and we, we we understand that God chose him, but God also expected David to be responsible, to face even the challenge from one of God's kings. God chose King Saul. 
But King Saul was rebellious. King Saul was unfaithful. King Saul was doing harm to himself and to the children of Israel. And there came a time when David had to go against Saul's house. So we have that recorded in 1 Chronicles 12, uh, verses 1 through 40. Then we have David's 37 mighty men who were a part of what God had instructed the children of Israel to deal with before they went into the land of Canaan. This is several years down the road from the time of Joshua. But there were enemies in the land. There were Philistines. There were Moabites. There were Egyptians. You need to read all of 2 Samuel 23, verses 8 through 39. But David's 37 mighty men who defeated the Philistines, the Moabites, and how they, they fought for God because David was on God's side. So they fought for David because David was on God's side. But David had to take the leadership as the king. And you have to understand that going against Saul's house, some of, some of Saul's own family, if you go read the text, some of Saul's own family fought against Saul because they believed God and they knew that Saul was not doing that, was not faithful. Then you have Micaiah over in 1 Kings 22, chapter 22, verses 1 through 40. Who, And you have to go read it all. If I read it all, we would not get finished with the lessons. As a student, it's up to you to read these texts and study them. But Micaiah prophesied against wicked Ahab, and Ahab had him drug away and put, you know, had him imprisoned, as it were. Uh, and yet Micaiah did what God said to do. He spoke for God. That took courage. He knew the potential of Ahab to do harm to him, and yet he went ahead and spoke for God anyway. People's souls are at stake. I've often wondered at times in some of these situations how other people who maybe not were mentioned or listed were affected in a positive way when they saw these spiritual leaders stand up against the enemies of God, the enemies of God's people, you know there had to be some who would who would didn't care. But then what about those who say, you know, those are some courageous men. And courageous men who step forward and do what is right will encourage others to do the same thing. And so it's not simply helping uh, the, the person who may be going astray. Hopefully they will listen, but others who may understand and their faith will be strengthened. I think about uh, John the Baptist when in Matthew 3, 7 through 13, that chapter where John is out preaching in the wilderness and baptizing people, but he warns the Jewish people the leaders who came there uh, to witness this and, you know, John basically asked, why do you want to be baptized? Uh, you know, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? John's not implying they weren't warned, but he's bringing, you know, there is a coming wrath. You need to bear fruit or bring forth fruit worthy of repentance. In other words, those Jews could not be baptized if they were not sincere. Well, that takes courage. That takes some backbone, as it were, to say, if you want to be baptized, you have to genuinely be ready to serve Jesus and put away things that are wicked in nature and bring not only put those things away, but bear fruit. Show that you want to do what's right. Well, that took courage on John's part. Jesus, uh, in driving out the money changers from the temple in John chapter 2, verses 13 through 17, they, they were making the temple, which Jesus called God's house, a house of merchandise. Well, that took courage on Jesus' part. We know Jesus was the son of God and he seemed not to fear anything or anyone. But even so, 
we can follow his example when things are not going the way they're supposed to be going or done, when things are being done that are not right, then those teachers or those practicers of those evil things have to be confronted. Jesus turned over the money changers' tables and drove out the animals they were selling. I mean, you know, I'm that obviously made those Jewish people very angry, but he still did the right thing. And then you've got John the Apostle in in uh, in Second John, uh, where confronting diatrophies in in, uh, in Third John. I'm sorry, in Third John, who was not receiving the brethren when they would come and ask for help. He wouldn't entertain the strangers. He wrote, John wrote to Gaius and, and gave him high marks for love and concern for those people. But he says, you know, when I come, I'm going to deal with diatrophies. Well, that would take courage on John's part to do that. These men were all successful as leaders in the kingdom. Now, let me clarify my statement. Success doesn't mean that everyone you teach or confront is going to change. The success comes when we are doing that which is pleasing to God. You know, Noah was successful. And you read those heroes of the faith in Hebrews chapter 11, who were by faith, they did this or that, and God commended them at the end of the chapter. Now, not everybody listened to Noah. Matter of fact, only eight souls were on the ark. And not everybody listened to Jesus. Not all the children of Israel listened to Joshua or the true prophets during that Old Testament era. And, you know, not all the Jews listened to John when he told them to bear fruit worthy of repentance. The success was not in necessarily in their response. The success was they were challenged with God's truth to do the right thing. So maybe we measure success sometimes the wrong way if we think, well, they didn't change and I failed. No, if you taught the truth, and you taught it in love, and you you covered the situation with the best of your ability, you prayed about it, prayed for wisdom, you took the Bible and showed it to people, and they didn't listen, you did not fail. The failure is when we do not deal with people who are living in sin that are under our preaching or under us, if you're an elder, a shepherd, the success is, did you say what God said? You know, in 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 13, Paul would tell the Christians in Corinth to be on the alert. To be on the alert. Sometimes uh, one of my neighbors came to me recently and asked if I'd seen anything unusual around her house. And so we were talking about that. And I said, no, I had not, but I'll keep my eyes open. If I see something strange going on at my neighbor's house, I will call my neighbor and say, I saw something that didn't look just right. Was that, was that okay or was that a problem? You know, and so to be on the alert is to keep your eyes and ears open for danger. Then he says, stand firm in the faith. This is the faith. The faith is Matthew through Revelation. It is the faith once for all delivered to the saints, as Jude explained it in verse three of his little epistle. The faith once for all delivered to the saints. And we are to defend that faith. Be firm in it. Do not move to the right or the left as God spoke to Joshua. Don't deviate or don't compromise on the, on the Bible when someone's doing wrong. Don't let them have uh, don't let them have their way. Hold them accountable. 
do it in love. Make sure they understand what you're telling them, that it's very clear that you've taken the Bible and you've sat down and you've looked at it and you've said, look, I'm here to help you. I love you. And I, God wants you and me both to do the right things. But the faith is the only way we can know whether or not we're doing that. Act like men. Be mature. Be responsible. One of the words the Bible uses about maturity is to be sober, to have a clear mind and act like a man. That means you have to, to deal with it as an adult. It's not easy sometimes, but do it and be strong. When I think about being strong, I think of someone who, again, will not give in to any kind of error, will not allow some brother or sister to manipulate the conversation or try to make excuses for what they're doing, but you be strong. And you know, if you're strong, if you're, if you're, if you are, if you stand firm in the faith and you act like a true man who's responsible, wouldn't it be nice if we could find more men like that today? more strong men, there's a greater chance that you will win that person than it would be if you just kind of, well, you know, you really ought to be doing the right thing. Look, you must do the right thing. Why? Because this is God's will we're talking about. This is not the elder's will. This is not the preacher's will. This is God's will. So standing firm in the faith is dealing with that which God has said. Courage will be needed to engage in the unpleasant task of discipline. I think about the church in Corinth, who's who a man, a man who had his father's wife. And Paul said, you know, the Gentiles, the Gentiles don't even do things like that. Now that didn't mean they never did, but he's typically they didn't even practice for the most part they didn't practice those kinds of things a man wouldn't be having relations with his father's wife uh, that's just, that's really kind of absurd but he says in verse one as paul writes to corinth the corinthian church in verse chapter five it is actually reported that there is immorality among you and immorality of such a kind as does not exist even among the Gentiles that someone has his father's wife. And so Paul is very clear as he confronts this. First of all, you become arrogant or proud and have not mourned instead. In other words, they seem to be happy that these people had this living arrangement. They didn't, uh, they didn't seem to see a problem with it, which means that obviously some people among the Gentiles had, wouldn't, wouldn't have a problem with it because these were mostly those kinds of people converted to Christ. You should have mourned about it. Should have made you sad. Should have made you sad. So that the one who has done this deed would be removed from your midst. In other words, you should have taken care of this. But Paul's writing them a letter letting them know you need to take care of this. He says in verse 3, For I on my part, though absent in body but present in spirit, have already judged him who has committed this as though I were present. Paul is saying I have enough evidence about this situation, I know the facts. Somebody had given him very clear facts that Paul had confidence in, and he wrote this by the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you, God does not approve of that arrangement, and I'm telling you about it. I And, and even though I'm not there, I'm telling you to deal with this, that I've judged him as being in sin. And he says in verse four, in the name of our Lord Jesus, when you are assembled and I with you in spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus, I have decided to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your boasting, verse six, is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? 
Clean out the old leaven, verse 7, so that you may be a new lump, just as you are, in fact, unleavened. For Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed. And he goes on and talks about uh, these things. But he says in verse 9, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with immoral people. Obviously, there was another letter that Paul wrote that we don't have access to. But he had written some letter, and obviously about that, do not associate with immoral people. And so he, did, he says, I don't mean the all the immoral people in the world or with the covetous and swindlers or with idolaters, but then you leave to go out of the have to go out of the world. But actually, I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother if he is an immoral person or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. So why, why are we talking about this? Because the church at Corinth was going to have to deal with it. Paul was not there, but he wrote to them and he says, look, I've judged this. Obviously, the Holy Spirit approved of Paul's judgment. You've got to do something about this situation. It's you're, you're bragging about it. You ought to be mourning about it. And you're going to have to put this wicked person away. Now, he gives a reason for it. So that the destruction of the flesh, so that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. That's why church discipline must be practiced at times. There are people that will refuse to do it because that's their family or they're afraid the whole church will just fall apart or get all upset. Listen, this is this is these are this is a commandment from God. We don't have a choice when it comes to the commandments of God. There are other other situations like those who are lazy in 2 Thessalonians 3, 6 through 15, that they don't even work. You know, you need to study that text and we won't look at all those details, but there are unpleasant tasks that elders and churches that don't have elders where the stronger men of the church, what if the church at Corinth didn't have elders? Let's just say they didn't. They'd still have to deal with it. Because a little leaven leavens the whole lump. What happens when you let some little thing go and you don't have the courage or the faith to deal with it? Other people begin to say, well, they didn't do anything about that. So I, that, so I don't guess they'll do anything about this. And next thing you know, all kinds of people are doing all kinds of sinful things because there was no loving, bold confrontation with the with the issue or those issues so one of the one of the qualities of true leadership is dealing with unpleasant tasks like discipline or confronting false teachers i want to look at titus chapter one and see what paul says to titus who's on the island of crete beginning with the fifth verse he says, for this reason, I left you in Crete that you would set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. In other words, I don't believe this first time Paul's talked to Titus about this. As I directed, it's not the first time. Namely, and he, he gives the qualifications and that's not the purpose of the lesson today. But I wanted to move move down to verse nine about what an elder should do. And it goes back to the idea of standing firm in the faith and what Paul told the elders in Ephesus. He commended them to God in the word of his grace and dealing with people that might be sheep stealers. He says in verse nine of Titus one, holding fast the faithful word, which is in accordance with the teaching. Now, that's the faith, the teaching. There aren't teachings, unless you talk about different points of doctrine. There's only one faith, Ephesians 4, and, and there's only one thing that's been revealed, the gospel, Jude 3. So the teaching, the whole 
whatever the issues might be, the whole of the New Testament, the new covenant of Christ, you hold, you hold fast. There again, staying firm in the faith, hold fast the faithful word, which is in accordance with the teaching so that he will be able both to exhort in sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict. So the elder's task here, first of all, is in exhorting in sound doctrine the church to let them know what the Bible teaches. And there again, act like a man, be strong, stand firm in the faith and teach them, but also refute those who contradict. I cannot confront someone in error if I don't know what the Bible teaches about that error. If I know what the Bible teaches, I can say, look, what you're saying is not in accordance with the teaching or with the doctrine. It is not in accordance with the faith once for all delivered to the saints. It is error. It's not true. And you must stop teaching that here. And because he goes on to say in verse 10 that there are many rebellious men, empty talkers. They don't have anything to back up what they're saying. And they deceive their deceivers, especially those of the circumcision. That would be the Jewish people. And they were teaching things like you. we have a note here uh, for Acts chapter 15, the old chapter primarily dealing with the idea that the Jews came to the Gentiles who were converted to Christ and said, you can't be saved unless you're circumcised. That's just one thing they were teaching. Well, it's, there's no circumcision requirement, physical circumcision requirement for the child of God. That was a Jewish covenant point but and he says they were teaching many things but he says they're deceivers they're not teaching the truth they're deceiving people and and especially those of the circumcision now what did paul say in verse 11 about those false teachers who must be silenced somehow you've got to stop them from teaching that you have to stop teaching that because it's not true and it's effective affecting the church and church members and God's sheep in a negative way and can cause them to fall away from Christ. And it says that he, that they are upsetting whole families. Whole families of the church could be leaving the church because of hearing things that are not true. Well, you got to silence that. You may have to go talk with those families and sit down and say, you know, what they're being, they've been saying to you is not true. It's false. It's error. But you've got to know the book to show them because you have to hold fast, verse 9, the faithful word. And teaching things they should not teach for the sake of sordid gain. And I guess some people do things like that for money. I know they do. There are people in false churches that their goal is money. Not They're not interested in souls. They're interested in how much money they will make. You look down here in at number three, that courage will be needed to engage in the unpleasant task of restoring the erring. And that's Galatians chapter six in verse one. And Paul gives a formula in Galatians six about how to restore an erring brother or sister. He says in verse 1 of Galatians 6, Brethren, even if anyone is caught or overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But each one must examine his own work, and then he will have reason for boasting in regard to himself alone, not in regard to another. For each one will bear his own burden. And so sometimes brethren are overtaken. They're overtaken with alcohol or some other kind of drug. They're overtaken with sexual promiscuity, uh, impropriety. 
They may be unfaithful to their spouses. They may be overtaken in gambling or just overtaken with the idea that it's not important to assemble with the saints. I mean, the list could go on the th of things that overtake people. And he says, you, the goal is to restore, to try to win them back to the Lord. And you got to look to yourself first so that you won't be tempted. And I've often wondered what he meant by that. I think one of the things he could be saying is don't compromise. Don't, don't make an excuse for that person. If you know that what they're doing is sinful, that they've been overtaken in sin. And so, but he says, you do it in a spirit of gentleness. I want to say one thing about that. Being firm is not contradictory to being gentle. I have had people tell me things at times. I had a brother tell me something one time that he noticed about myself and he was firm about it. I understood what he was saying but he was gentle with it. That's, that's the way you deal with people. Now, sometimes you have to, you have to come down harder on some people. You need to know the person you're talking to understand them, but courage is needed in restoring the airing because what James tells us that, that you can save in James chapter five, that you can save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. So you think about the courage, but what's the goal to restore, to prevent someone from dying spiritually, from being lost and going to hell. I mean, we, we don't want people to be lost and go into eternity without Jesus and spend eternity in hell with the devil. Number four, courage will be needed to stand in the face of unpleasant pressures of disgruntled or upset members of the congregation who may try to push something that's inexpedient or something that is unscriptural. There may be some brother or sister or group of people that come up with an idea about something they'd like to see done, but maybe it may not be wrong but it may not be the best for that congregation. Every congregation has its personalities and other characteristics. You have to weigh it out. Would that be good for the congregation here or might it be make things more difficult? I'm not talking about doctrinal things. I'm talking about matters of judgment that maybe not right or wrong. It's just not best. But they push, they push, they push. Well, this is what I want. And if I don't get my way, I'm going to leave. And, and if I leave, I'm going to take some people with me and as, you know, or I'm going to just quit or, you know, I mean, those things can happen. And how you deal with that is try to reason with those people in a loving way and a clear way and say, you know, that's really not best for the church here. And maybe you could compromise on what they want to do. Again, this is not something doctrinal. It just may be something that's an expedient, like what time the church meets or some activity that they'd like to see. I had someone one time recommend something for the congregation where I preached. Said, I'd really like to see this happen here. Well, the problem was we didn't have the people in our congregation to make that happen. It was a wonderful idea, and it would be wonderful if we had the people to make that happen. But they didn't push the issue. But there, then there were there have been people who will push for this and push for that, and if they don't, you know, they just on and on and on about it, and they upset people. And sometimes even themselves, well, they don't want to do it. They want someone else to do it. Dealing with upset or disgruntled members of the church uh, can be very challenging. So that will end our lesson for today, and we will pick up with today's leaders being adept in handling criticism next.